All right. Well, last time we met together, beginning of the month, um, we just dedicated the whole time to worship. And um, that's, that's our starting place. That's, you know, that's what we want this, this house built upon, worship and celebration and praise and all of that. So uh, we didn't have a message. We just wanted to, you know, have the time set out for that. But today, I do have something I want to share, something um, that God put in my heart during the week as I was just praying and thinking about today and being back together and all of that. Um, and it's specifically a passage from Isaiah, um, Isaiah 50, I'm sorry, Isaiah 45. And it's a passage that has to do with a, a, a king named Cyrus. And uh, I want to just read the first few verses of this chapter, and then um, and we'll pray again. How about that? That's a good starting place, all right? And then we'll, we'll see where we go from there, okay? So it's Isaiah 45, I'm going to read just the first three verses, okay? Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. That's a good passage. All right, Father, we ask that you would cut through any iron bars over our hearts and our minds today. God, that you would come in with supernatural power and glory, Father. You are not limited by anything. You are the God of the impossible. So, Father, I am asking for amazing, remarkable things today, Father, in the lives, in the hearts of people here. Everyone watching, everyone who will listen to this, God, I pray that you would release light, light and breakthrough, Father. I pray that you would just uncover, that you would expose, God, that you would release your power tangibly in our lives. We thank you for these things, Father. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for uh, that, that you are an a very present help. You are with us. So God, bless uh, the listening of this word, Father, the reading of this word. Lord, lead us and guide us as we go through it. In your son's name I pray, amen. Amen. Okay, let me just start by giving you guys some of the context of this passage. How many people have heard of this passage before? Uh, the treasures of darkness. Okay, um, I, I expected maybe not everyone would raise their hand. It is it is a popular scripture, but it's not one that maybe uh, the majority are familiar with. But it's a beautiful little gem hidden in in the prophecies of of Isaiah, and he's talking hundreds of years in advance about a guy named Cyrus. He's calling him by name. And he's saying to this guy that, you know, you one day are going to be raised up by God, this pagan king. He's from the land of Persia. He's Iranian, right? That's where modern day Persia is. He's from Iran. He's the king of Iran. And God is saying, you, you are going to be raised up one day to go in and set my exiles free and bring them back into their homeland, right? So Isaiah's prophesying into the future. He's speaking to the time when the Jews would be conquered by Babylon. And uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, right, he came into Babylon and he destroyed the temple and broke down the city walls and he exiled the whole nation, brought them out into all these different countries and territories. And, uh, and there they were for 70 years. Another prophet, Jeremiah, said that, um, that they would be in captivity for 70 years years. But then after that time frame, God would gather up the Jewish people from around the countries they'd been scattered and he would bring them back and God would use a king named Cyrus for that purpose. So, um, so you have this passage where God says, I'm going to go before you. I'm going to shatter the doors of bronze. I am going to defeat the invincible, quote unquote, invincible Babylonian empire. The Babylonian Empire was the greatest empire in history at that point, strong, powerful, just ate up nations and uh, destroyed whatever they wanted. 
and uh, seem to have it all in control, all in, under their, their domain. And um, you're talking about hundreds of years, right? I mean, think of, think of America. I mean, we have been a nation for what, 270 something years, 280 years. I mean, that's nothing compared to these ancient empires. Like they, these guys have been around for a long time. It was settled in people's minds. They're not going anywhere. And God is, you know, saying, I am going to, to, to use you, Cyrus, to break through what seems impossible, to shatter this, um, this regime. And, uh, and things are going to change, and I'm going to give you treasure and hidden wealth. So uh, you got to understand, when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, went in and he destroyed the temple, it says that all of his soldiers went in and took the uh, treasury. They took the gold and the silver and all of these precious items that were in the temple. They took it and they carried it off to Babylon. Right? So when it's saying, I'm going to give you treasures in the darkness, I'm going to give you the hidden wealth, I believe, uh, and a lot of you know, scholars and you know, Bible commentaries believe that God was saying, I'm going to give back all of that treasure that was taken by Babylon. That's this secret, awesome treasure in the darkness. And so, um, so uh, I want to just, before I really unpack the meaning of this here, get into it, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what the Bible has to say about this gold and silver and treasure. Because um, I, I believe that essentially the temple that Babylon destroyed is uh, a representation of human beings. And, and that's not my personal belief. That's stated very clearly in the Bible. It says you are a temple, right? You all know that, right? You are the temple. Your body is a temple, right? This is the temple that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed was actually a picture of the human frame, the human body. The temple had three parts to it, right? It had the outer court that was exposed to the outside elements, had no roof or covering. It had that on the outside. Then it had this inner room that was hidden behind a curtain. And then it had an innermost room, the holy of holies, three parts. And in the same way, human beings are three parts. We're tripartite is one of the words that are used to describe human beings. We have a body that's on the outside. Everyone can see it. It's exposed to the elements, literally. But behind the curtain, there's an inner room. There's your personality. That's your soul, right? That's your emotions, your being, your mind, all of that. But then there's even something deeper inside of you. There's an innermost room, and that's your spirit. So we are spirit soul and body okay so babylon going in to destroy the temple is actually a picture a prophetic image of the enemy coming in and stealing the gold and the silver of our souls okay it's it's it, our souls were meant to be prosperous and beautiful filled with godly personality godly fruits of peace and joy and gentleness and kindness and all of those wonderful things, a sound mind, all of that has been broken down and stolen by the enemy. So the human heart is the gold, the treasure that these prophetic passages are ultimately pointing to. There's other layers we're going to unpack. You know, the Bible is amazing in that it's multi-layered. There's other things that we can draw from this, but that is the, uh, I think that's at the, the heart of it you know, pun intended there. That's at the core of what it's about. So the prophecy is incredible and uh, very encouraging what God says to Cyrus that he's going to restore uh, the, this treasure. Um, and it has a lot of implications for us. So before I talk about us and how this applies to us, I first want to look at how this passage is ultimately speaking about Christ and Christ's work. And listen, I, I, you know, I try over and over again to like give really practical messages, like very personal, I don't know, personal, encouraging messages. But whenever I read the Bible and go to teach it, I can't get away from Jesus in the Bible. I just can't unsee Christ in the scripture. So I can't help it. I just, every time I open up the word, it's like, I gotta, I gotta show you Jesus in the word. So we're going to start with that. And honestly, in my opinion, I think that probably is the most practical thing I could give you because... When Jesus is lifted up, when you see him clearly, all of a sudden, a lot of what you thought were your problems start to diminish. You're, you're, you just get flooded with light. When he's lifted up, when what he has done fills your vision, instead of what you need to do, which is what a lot of sermons are filled with, like 
X, Y, and Z of what you need to accomplish and do and create and whatever, believe. I don't know, all this stuff. Like when you see what Jesus believes, what Jesus does, what he's accomplished, I think that changes things. That's why I love, you know, the old song, turn your eyes unto Jesus, right? Look full in his wonderful face and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we're gonna look at Jesus first before we talk about how this applies to us. So, um, so King Cyrus, okay, there's a lot of talk today about King Cyrus in the prophetic community and how he relates to uh, certain political things happening in the world. And I am on board with that stuff. I agree with a lot of it. But there is something much more central about Jesus Christ in the figure of Cyrus, okay? So let me tell you, first of all, what this says in the original language, okay? Cyrus in the, in the original tongue was Koresh. That was his name, Koresh. And it was the word that the Persians would use to describe the sun, like the sun in the sky. The name literally is translated as the possessor of the furnace. And they would use this word Koresh what we translate as Cyrus to describe the sun. But let me tell you what else is in the Hebrew. It says in Isaiah 45, thus says the Lord to Koresh Mashiach. Now, if you're familiar with Hebrew at all, you should know that that word, Mashiach, is the word for Messiah. Yes, Messiah. The word Messiah in the Hebrew is the word for anointed. So Jesus, Yeshua Christos, Christos is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Mashiach, right? You know that Christ is in his last name. He's Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christos, Jesus the anointed one, right? So this is speaking to the son, the Messiah. So before anything else, King Cyrus was a type of, and shadow of Jesus, our Messiah. Jesus is the one Isaiah is prophesying about here. God, we're, see, in this passage and in so many passages of the Old Testament, you are listening in to a conversation between the Father and the Son. It's amazing. You're listening to words from the Father that he's promising his Son, Jesus. All throughout these, these prophecies in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and, uh, and so forth. And so God is saying to the son here, to his son, he's saying, I am making a promise. I am going to subdue nations before you. I am going to open doors that no one will be able to shut, it says. And that should clue you in big time that this is really talking about Jesus. Uh, in the book of Revelation, in particular, in the New Testament, Jesus says, I am he who holds the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, and who shuts and no one opens. So God is saying to Jesus, listen, you are going to conquer this world, but not like the emperors and the kings of this age. You're going to conquer this world through the power of the Spirit transforming hearts. You're going to be subduing the wild terrain of wickedness over people's souls. That's what needs to be subdued to create real peace on earth. Kings and emperors subdue armies with literal guns and swords, and they take over physical territory. Jesus wages war with truth and peace and agape love. And he wages war against the real things that cause all the wars and other problems in the first place. The guilt and the fear and the idolatry and all this other stuff that, that, that comes up like thorns and weeds over the human heart. So the father is saying to the son, I'm going to give you nations. And then that leads to this next verse where he says, I will give you the treasures of darkness and that hidden wealth in secret places. So guess what that's talking about? I already said it. 
Yes, us. So you are hidden wealth. You are treasure. When the Father talks about you to Jesus, he refers to you as his treasure. You are the treasure. When the king of Babylon plundered the temple, right? That was a picture of the enemy taking over our lives, taking over our souls and how we were designed to live, holding us captive to sin. And the father's saying to Jesus, I'm going to give them back to you. Oh, this is good news because it's a promise between the father and son. Guess what? This isn't contingent upon your work. The father and the son are in cahoots together. They're working this out, and we get to be the recipients of what they are accomplishing. So I find this beautiful that, you know, you have to just take it in. You have to just take another breath and say, I am treasure. Like, just think about that. You know, the, the phrase self-esteem has been so watered down that it, it just, it just, it doesn't even hit you anymore because you've been told the, you know, the phrase self-esteem from when you're little and they teach it in, you know, schoolyard classes and I don't know, it just doesn't have the impact. But think about that word for a second, esteem. To esteem something is to see the worth and the value of it. So you better believe that self-esteem is in the package of our salvation of what Christ wants us to have, to esteem the worth and the value of your being. You need to personalize this right now. It's talking about you. But now I want you to take like two or three breaths because I want you to then think about this for the world. This is how God sees the whole world. So when God looks at the world, he doesn't see, you know, all these wretched sinners. He sees hidden wealth in dark places. So the darkness doesn't define us. The darkness only hides us. I love listening in to these conversations between the father and the son. It's a lot healthier than listening to other conversations going on around us. Yeah. Amen. So as we, um, as we embrace relationship with God, here's another one to just... As you embrace relationship with God, you make God rich. What do I mean by that? I mean, like, because we're talking about the God who is the richest being in the universe, right? He owns it all, cattle on a thousand hills, stars in a thousand galaxies, right? He owns it all. But you actually enrich God. You make God rich as you come back into the temple of your true identity and intimacy with him. I'll explain what I mean by that as a dad. So... This hit me just a few days ago, Thanksgiving. So we, we, because of some different circumstances, we had to spend Thanksgiving just as a family, just us in the home. So it was very different this year. And at first we were very disappointed about that. But we ended up having, Kelly and I and Morgan and Annabelle, we just had an amazing Thanksgiving together. It was beautiful. Kelly did just an extraordinary job, full out meal like it was for 20 people. And it was beautiful. And the girls had a great time. And in this intentional time as a family, I just, I came to this moment, it hits me at times, I wish it hit me more often, but it hit me how rich I am, how blessed I am, just overwhelmed. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, where this clarity comes over you and you realize, like, what's really important, right? I just, I felt so blessed. I felt like the richest man in the world sitting there at the table. That is just, that's one iota of what God feels when you come to the communion table. 
when you open up your arms to your Abba Father. That's how he feels. He feels rich when you are embracing that love, walking with him, all of that. So um, we truly bless God. You know, bless the Lord. You know that song? I think we sung it, right, today? <laughs> bless the, you bless the Lord. You bless the Lord. I was blessed by my children. Going around the table, we had everyone say, say what they're thankful for. When it got to Annie, she said, I'm thankful for Easter. <laughs> okay. Sure. <laughs> I was blessed. I was blessed by them, right? We bless the Father. So anyway, just a window into the heart of God. Um, Isaiah 45 is a promise from the Father to Christ, Mashiach, saying, I am going to give them to you. Human hearts, we're going to conquer this world together in love. Children, brothers and sisters, that's God's promise to Jesus. Okay, so here's where I want to flip this from Christ to us. Okay, and I want you to also understand that this is a promise for you as well. So I'm just going to take a few more minutes here, and I want to talk about the treasures that God has laid up in store for all of us. Okay? And I really just have three different things. See, I'm, I, this is my attempt to actually give you a practical three-point message. <laughs> I have three things that, that I want to pinpoint are treasures due to us that God wants us to understand. He is a giver of good things. He wants us to be blessed. You have to get this. This is the whole point of the cross. God gave his son. God is a giver. This is who he is. This is not some health and wealth prosperity preacher gospel. It's the gospel, capital G. God is a giver. He wants so much more. I think a lot of people who have a hard time with the word prosperity, I think they have issues with their dad. I do. Their, their heavenly father. I think there's some... And it gets, it gets distorted, unfortunately. You have a lot of people who, who preach the message and take it in weird directions. But, but when you understand the heart of God, you understand that he is an extravagant giver. So I want to talk about that with you because it says in, um, in Ephesians 1 that we have been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, the key word there, the two key words, are in Christ. Those are the keys that unlock the whole Bible, in Christ. What that means, when you ever you see the phrase in Christ, what that means is that you are in union with Christ, or because of your union with him, your oneness with him, you have been made one with him. Like a bride taking her bridegroom's name, you have taken his name, you've been brought into his household, everything that's his is yours. You're in Christ. That's what that means. So I can't talk about the promises to Jesus without also talking about the promises to you. Because everything given to Jesus has been given to you because you are in union with him. So you can read Ephesians 1 and it says, every spiritual blessing in heavenly places has been given to you because of your union with Jesus. Because you share his name. So it's, it's not, you know, an issue of something you have to earn. This is, this is the key of in Christ that unlocks every blessing of the Bible. When you realize that you are one with the Holy One, you share his name. So everything due to him is yours. Freely. It's a gift. Okay? So stick with me a couple minutes here as we go through some treasures that God wants to unlock in your life. These are things due to you because of your union with Jesus. Everybody clear? Everybody with me? Okay. So, first of all, we're going to start with how we started with Jesus, that this is speaking about people and relationships. Okay? So just like this was a word for Jesus about relationships, restored relationships, this is also a promise for us in a similar way. And I'll give you a, an example of how I apply this, okay, for myself. So I am believing for the youth of this region 
to have encounters with Jesus Christ that would set them free from their captivity to all kinds of shame and addiction and darkness. So I'm believing for the youth of this country, the youth of this, this region, to be restored from captivity because there are doors of bronze, iron gates of social media, and the entertainment industry that, that seems to be invincible, that seems to be way too strong for us to have any impact. But I'm believing that the one that breaks doors of bronze and cuts through iron bars is with us and able to retrieve the plunder of the enemy. But I believe that God is looking for people he can partner with in faith that can believe him at his word and say yes to him and say, I want my full inheritance. I am receiving my full inheritance. So, of course, these things take time. I'm not just saying that like instantly, you know, this could mean uh, a person comes uh, into the right relationship because relationships require time. I mean, God can encounter somebody, change them in a moment. That happened to me. I was held captive. I was a youth. I was 18 years old, held in all kinds of chains of bondage, and God came to me. But, you know, for some people it takes time, and for other relationships maybe that we're looking for healing from, there's, there's process, there's stuff involved in this, but there is always an underlying current of hope when we know that God is with us and able to cut through whatever's blocking the door, whatever's holding back things, okay? So that's, that's first. I just want to build faith today to say that, that seeing restoration, whether in families, relationships, this stuff is on the table as a gift, in Christ. Okay, second thing is that, I've already kind of alluded to this, but I do believe that this can apply to finances as well. This can apply to actual literal wealth when it says hidden wealth. And um, listen, it would be so much better for wealth to be in the hands of someone who is godly and wants to spread the gospel and help out the poor than wealth in the hands of a cartel or a corrupt politician or something, right? Right? I mean, when we pray on earth as it is in heaven, like we're, we're believing for righteousness to come to earth. We're believing for justice. So righteousness and justice manifesting on earth involves the proper balance of goods and resources. So don't tell me finances being put into the hands of the righteous isn't part of God's kingdom plans. It's absolutely part of his plans. Of course, he wants to give it into mature hands, hands that know how to give and steward. That's why it's, you know, faithful with the small things, the little things, and then there's, you know, there's increase that comes. But still, God wants to give it. He wants finances to flow through the resources of his children. So I believe this, these promises that are due to Christ, that are then ours by grace. They involve relationships. They involve transformed people. They involve finances. But I'm going to end with this last thing, and I think this is one of the greatest riches that you can have in your life, and that is joy and peace. Okay? This is part of your inheritance. Listen to me today. Joy and peace in any circumstance. Your soul exhibiting happiness and stress-free living, even in difficult circumstances, is a treasure of the darkness. There is treasure that comes out of the darkness. It's one way you can interpret that. So there is a supernatural joy and peace to be found in every period of darkness that you encounter. Every moment where things appear dark, unsure, foreboding, falling apart, there, there's treasure to be found in it. And again, I think one of the primary treasures is, is supernatural peace. Do you know the scripture where the guy says to Jesus he wants to follow him? And Jesus says, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. 
You know that one? I think it's from Matthew uh, chapter 8. Um, okay, so you can read that in a really religious way. Remember when I said people have issues with their heavenly dad for uh, numerous reasons? Like, we can take our issues and apply it to the way that we read the Bible. So you can read the Bible through a certain lens because of how you see God. And it actually interprets the words for you. And if you have a pastor or a seminarian or a theologian doing that and giving their bad relationship with God to you through the pulpit or a book, then, then they could populate the earth with their bad theology. So um, you can read this. A lot of people do read this, like almost like Jesus is saying, and be honest with me, let me know if you've kind of read it in this context, like Jesus is saying to this guy, I want to follow you. And Jesus is saying, like, don't follow me unless you want to be miserable. You know, even the, even the foxes have holes to sleep in. But if you follow me, you won't have anywhere to sleep. It's going to be really tough. And we kind of imagine it like Jesus saying it with this like stone cold face. Come on, who here knows what I'm talking about? All right. We, we, I think we miss the heart of God. We miss the heartbeat, the spirit of the law instead of the letter of the law. Right? We got to get the heartbeat of our Father. So um, I was reading this passage again the other day. This is kind of a side note, but this is so beautiful. I, gotta, I, got, I just had to share this today. I noticed something I never saw before. So you have this guy says, I want to follow you, Jesus. And Jesus says, you know, foxes have holes, birds of the earth have nests, all that stuff. And, um, and then a few verses later, same scenario, same chapter, same paragraph, basically, um, it says the disciples followed Jesus, and they followed him onto a boat. Okay, so he just got done saying that, and then right away a group of people followed Jesus onto a boat. And, um, and the first thing he does is he falls asleep. So the next scene after Jesus saying, I have nowhere to lay my head, Jesus lays his head down in a boat, and then a storm comes. And you all know this story, right? The storm hits the boat, and the disciples think that they're going to die. Storm clouds come. I mean, it was a serious enough storm for Galilean fishermen to be freaking out. This was probably a very heavy storm, very dark. It's probably a lot of darkness. And Jesus is passed out. Jesus is snoozing. I bet Jesus, when Peter woke him up, like, Lord, we're drowning, I bet he was tempted to, like, hit the snooze button, like, push Peter's nose or something. <laughs> like, I'm not worried, Peter. He wasn't worried. He was at peace, literally, right? He was sleeping, but, of course, he gets up, he rebukes the storm, and he, you know, he says, you have little faith. You, you, you know the story, right? So, so... Think about this whole scenario again, okay? He just told the guy on the shore, it's most likely on the shoreline somewhere, that this guy, you know, said to him, I want to follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, I have nowhere to lay my head. But then he demonstrated something and showed the guy and all of us, chronicled here for us to read 2,000 years later, that actually he has everywhere to lay his head because he was constantly at rest on the inside. So he didn't need a hole in the ground or a nest or something that looked outwardly secure because he had an inner pillow all the time. So this guy was actually being invited into something more amazing, a better kind of life than he could have ever imagined. So Kelly and I, as many of you know, we've been praying for a house. Many of you have been praying for us, for a house. And we are like way past the due date on this one. Like we were expecting something. I even got a prophetic word from someone that it was going to be by a certain date, all this stuff, and it didn't happen. And in those moments, you can get very tempted to go on a bad path in your mind, you know, start accusing God of things and all kinds of stuff. And um, it's not at all like we're in a bad situation where we're at, but we have a growing family and we're, you know, we need to spread our wings and have, have a place of our own. And we've been wanting that, desiring that, praying for that. And it, it, it hasn't happened yet. And it's way past, you know, again, our target of what we had done practically and even what we felt spiritually. At one point, 
but it's it's been amazing that in the midst of this year because when you know the coronavirus hit the housing market just went crazy and it's a seller's market now so we probably would have been in a house if it wasn't for the fact of how the markets were affected so um so a storm came a storm a literal freaking wild storm has come in 2020 and uh, and things have not gone the way that i expected in my following of Jesus and my understanding of what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. And I'll be honest with you guys, like there have been points this year, especially earlier in the year, where I was really questioning a lot of things. I'm way past the, the place of doubting God, like his existence, like, you know, the devil knows he can't get me with that. It's like laughable, but he can get me to doubt God's goodness. He can absolutely try to steal that from me. And there were moments where, I mean, I, it was, I felt like I was in a spiritual battle of my life this year. So it's, it, it's, it's been a tough one, but I'm telling you, I'm seeing this more and more, and I'm hearing this from other people, that God has been showing us a place of peace in the storm that nothing can take away from you. Nothing. No virus, no election, no anything. No societal, environmental, political storm, nothing can steal this peace. He's been building this inner pillow. And it's past my timing. It's past, you know, I, I'm realizing that this year, that I do not understand the timing of God, and it's, it's outside of my hands. But he is, he is literally building this treasure in the darkness. And it's awesome. And I'm genuine before you guys. I'm not just blowing smoke right now trying to give you like a motivational message like i am speaking from my heart like i am discovering treasure this year in the midst of a lot of difficulty beautiful treasure this is our inheritance joy is your inheritance peace is your inheritance transformed relationships people are your inheritance Financial breakthrough is in your inheritance. All of it, because it's given to Jesus, and you're his beloved. You're his beloved. It's yours. So join me in prayer. Father, we ask right now that you would just open up the floodgates wide in our minds, God, in our hearts, to expect and to dream again. Father, to come to you to renew our trust in your goodness and to dig deeper, Father, into the, the, the riches that are buried all around of us, even right in front of our face. I want you to get your communion elements ready here. This was a, uh, doesn't look like it with this little tiny cup, but this was a marriage cup of wine. That's what Jesus was pouring out on the night that he was betrayed. It was, it was the cup of marriage wine. Uh, it was the covenant of his union with us as a faithful bridegroom. Faithful and true. And that everything that he received from the Father he would give to us freely. So I want you to think for a moment. I want you to just meditate, pray, ask God, what are the treasures? Ask him to give you night vision if things are tough for you right now. If all you see is are, are, are things that speak the opposite of God's goodness. Ask him to give you night vision to see the gold and the silver to see the peace that's already inside of you. There is a well of peace inside of you. There are plans and purposes he has, even though you might not get the timing right. There are wonderful things ahead, and it is all because of this covenant, this promise. So when we take this bread right now, hold on. Oh, that was an accident. Hooked it up to the microphone. 
I want you to hear it being opened, opening up Christmas gifts under the tree. God has gifts for you. All right, close your eyes again. Lock into his face. It brings him joy to bless you. And you are a blessing to him. When you look to him and you, you choose to, to see beyond whatever's clouding that vision. Father, we thank you today for the precious covenant of Jesus, the union that we have with our true Cyrus, the true anointed one who has already redeemed us, who has already defeated the empire of the enemy and has given us every blessing in heavenly places. God, we call those blessings forth on earth right now. Every single thing we call forth, God, those, those blessings that are ours in heaven, let it be on earth. Father, let joy and peace erupt. God, where there's need, where there's financial need, relational need, God, I pray for gifts to manifest and overflow. Bless each one now, Father, and we bless you. We receive your body. Amen. Let's take and eat. And here's the marriage cup. We're to drink this in celebration, okay? You understand that? Go ahead, put a smile on underneath those masks. Let me see. I want to use a smile so big that it's just overflowing. Yeah. Yeah, smile, because it's done. It's finished. You are already married to the Lord. You are already blessed in Him. You're already loved. I'm telling you, that, that pillow is already yours. So we receive the cup, Jesus. We thank you. We praise you, God. We thank you so much, Father, for your amazing salvation, your glorious love. And again, God, we receive all that you've poured out in Christ's name. Amen.